Winston Churchill once told Stalin, the Mediterranean is the soft underbelly of the crocodile. Churchill and the British chiefs of staff were sure that attacking German-occupied Europe through Italy would help shorten the war. The Americans were not convinced, preferring to concentrate on the decisive blow across the English Channel. Only reluctantly did they agree to join their British allies on the road to Rome. November 1942, 11 months after Pearl Harbor, the American army prepared for its first encounter with the Wehrmacht. Operation Torch, code name for the Anglo-American landings in the French North African colonies of Morocco and Algeria. They met little or no resistance from the forces of Vichy France. The French command soon broke with the government of Pétain and their troops became part of the Allied armies. An American general, Dwight D. Eisenhower, was supreme commander. The American planners were never keen on the operation, but President Roosevelt was determined to get his ground forces into action against Hitler in 1942. Attacking the Germans in Tunisia was the next best thing to a second front in Europe. At Casablanca, within two months of the landings, an impressive array of British and American top brass assembled. The Russians were not present, but everybody there knew that they had to do something to take the pressure off the Red Army. Churchill and Roosevelt had now to decide where they went from here. At the beginning of 1943, the British and Americans were firmly established in North Africa. Hitler had reinforced Rommel's forces in Tunisia. But with the British Eighth Army closing from the east, it could only be a matter of time before the entire African coastline was in Allied hands. What then? We've got to face the fact that there was a big difference between the two sides about what the future strategy of the war would be. Uh, the British, the British Chiefs of Staff, Churchill, uh, were all in favor of the future of the campaign uh, being carried out through Italy and hitting at the underside of the underbelly of the Germans, moving up and eventually joining up with the Russians. The Americans held exactly the opposite view. Uh, they felt that the only way that you could defeat Germany was to take the shortest way into the center of Germany, across the channel, and uh, advance into the areas of the Ruhr and Saar, the great industrial areas, and then destroy the German forces by that means. The British, led by Sir Alan Brooke, chief of the Imperial General Staff, came to Casablanca determined to have their way. They got it. 
The Americans under General Marshall were persuaded that the next objective would be the invasion of Sicily, leading, it was hoped, to the surrender of Italy. Thus, the main Second Front was postponed for another year. At the time, however, the big news from the Casablanca Conference was an unexpected pronouncement by the American president. Mr. Roosevelt began by saying that uh, when he was a young man, great reputation in, American, in the American military was General Grant, who had once sent an order saying that he would accept no terms but unconditional surrender, and that these, in fact, were the terms that the Allies or the United Nations wanted to present to their enemies. He then went on as though he did not understand how important a statement he had made. Mr. Churchill looked considerably surprised at this, and I think that Mr. Churchill felt that it was not the best way to present the Allied position to the enemy. However, as he said then and later, he was Mr. Roosevelt's ardent lieutenant, and he would go along with it. After the talking, Roosevelt appeared in his other capacity, Commander-in-Chief of the American Armed Forces. If this fresh, confident-looking American army had crossed the Atlantic expecting to carry all before it, it was very soon cruelly disillusioned. In a sudden onslaught through the Kasserine Pass in Tunisia, Rommel inflicted on the American army one of its worst defeats of the entire war. The Africa Corps was far too well equipped and experienced for the lightly armored and underpowered American tanks. The morale of these raw young Americans was badly shaken. Many were taken prisoner. face to face with the fact that uh, this was going to be a long war and a tough one and the Germans were very good. Armies never learn from other armies, they have to learn by themselves and a lot of the tactics that we used disastrously at Kasserine were those that the British Army had used equally disastrously two years before in the Western Desert and then discarded. I think it helped our army, it also made them realize, because the British came down from the north and did help, that this was going to be a cooperative effort, that we couldn't win it alone. And also, it got the average GI accustomed to the fact that there was going to be one battle after another. But Rommel lacked the strength to exploit his victory. The Allies under Alexander regrouped and within 10 days retook the pass. The Germans in Tunisia were now hemmed in. The Allied sea and air blockade of the coastline made large-scale evacuation impossible. In the south, a forward patrol of the 8th Army linked up with the American 2nd Corps. The trap closed. Two Allied forces, once separated by 2,000 miles of mountain and desert, joined hands for the final onslaught on the German position in Africa. Allied armies, vastly superior in numbers, drove the enemy, now without Rommel, who had been invalided home, back through the mountains of Tunisia towards the sea. The Allied air forces had undisputed control. In seven days, 
was all over. Finally, the Africa Corps saw no point in fighting to the last man. They surrendered in droves. The unfortunate General Fananim, who succeeded Rommel, also surrendered with all his staff. Nearly a quarter of a million men were taken prisoner, a victory to rank alongside Stalingrad. This was a major boost for the British and their Mediterranean strategy. Sicily, as agreed at Casablanca, was the next item on the agenda. Only two months after the German collapse in Tunisia, the British and Americans began landing troops on Sicilian beaches. The British were led by Montgomery, the Americans by General Patton. The first time these two egocentric personalities had been involved in the same campaign. the British Eighth Army, which met the fiercest German resistance. On their left, Patton's Americans swept across Sicily in style. They found useful allies in the Mafia and family connections among the civilian population. I think the situation was uh, relieved somewhat by the fact that there was hardly a family in Sicily that didn't have relatives in the United States. The Sicilian landing, bringing the war onto their own soil, convinced most Italians that theirs was a lost cause. Giving themselves up, if possible, by the regiment became the first objective of Italy's armed forces. <laughs> Allied bombing raids on Rome provided another argument for getting out of the war. Benito Mussolini, il duce for 20 years, was outvoted in his own fascist Grand Council. On July the 25th, he was toppled from power. King Victor Emmanuel approved the elderly Marshal Badoglio as head of the government. Badoglio declared publicly that the war would go on but immediately began secret negotiations with the Allies for surrender. By now, Sicily, after only a few weeks, was almost all in Allied hands. This time, there was to be no great haul of German prisoners. German evacuation across the narrow straits of Messina was highly successful. Most of the Fairmark's personnel got away to the mainland. Even the last guard dog. General Patton beat Montgomery into Messina. The Allies had landed in Sicily not knowing where they would go next. With the prospect of an early Italian collapse, the British were all for attacking the mainland. The Americans agreed to a limited campaign, but insisted that Overlord, the invasion of Normandy, must take priority for resources. A secret envoy, General Castellano, was sent by Badoglio to find out on what terms Italy could join the Allies. But the Allies simply wanted Italian surrender and refused to tell Castellano of their invasion plans. 
partly because they didn't want the Italians to know how limited their forces were. All we could say to General Castellan was this. Well, we will tell you two or three hours before it happens uh, so that you can give any assistance you can to the uh, British, to the Allied operations. Eventually, on the 3rd of September, uh, these uh, terms were signed. On that day, the Allies invaded. Montgomery went across the Straits of Messina to attack the toe of Italy, but found no resistance. The Germans had moved north to counter the threat of an Allied landing further up the coast. The Italians had wanted a landing to safeguard Rome from German attack, but this was impossible. The furthest point north at which the Americans and British felt it prudent to land was nowhere near Rome but at Salerno, as far as the Allied air cover operating from Sicily could stretch. The operation had been mounted at great speed to take advantage of the confusion in Italy. The forces at the command of the American General Mark Clark were barely adequate for the job they had to do. On the way, the troops heard a broadcast by General Eisenhower. The Italian government has surrendered its armed forces unconditionally. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice. The armistice was signed by my representatives and the representative of Marshal Badoglio, and it becomes effective this instant. The surrender of his allies did not take Hitler by surprise. He had already moved reinforcements into northern Italy. Here the Italians were quickly disarmed under a plan ironically codenamed Operation Axis. At this point, Hitler had not decided just where he would hold the line. The Germans entered Rome to find it a capital without a government. Badoglio and his ministers had avoided the risk of being shot for treachery by leaping into their cars and driving away. South of Rome, Clark's invasion force was nearing the beaches. Salerno, if you go in on a boat, you look at the, uh, the mountains that hem you in there and the passes through which you go. The enemy would be looking down your throat. Germans were ready and waiting. Eight hours, the Germans launched a furious counterattack. The situation in the beachhead became so precarious, Clark ordered plans for possible re embarkation. With massive support from air and sea, the Salerno invaders just managed to hold on.
After a week of savage fighting, the Germans withdrew. It required the intervention of all the air forces to save us at Salerno. Of all General Eisenhower's battles, that is the one where he, I think we kept near, uh, we were nearest to a tactical defeat. I've never had any doubts in my mind that it was a completely successful operation. We, we, uh, we were ordered to go in there. We were ordered to seize a bridgehead. Uh, we did it. Uh, we were ordered to capture the port of Naples. We did that within uh, three weeks. So far, so good. At least a large part of southern Italy was in Allied hands. <laughs> Naples was desperately short of food. There were bread riots. Water was scarce. There was the typhus epidemic. The advance continued. But just ahead lay the line of real German resistance. The Allied commanders had hoped Hitler would withdraw further north. Instead, greatly encouraged by his near victory at Salerno, he had decided to fight here, in the mountains south of Rome. Like a bad Lira, Mussolini turned up again. He was hoisted out of his hiding place by a German rescue party and taken to Hitler. The Führer was aghast at his appearance, but thought he might still come in useful to encourage the fascists in German-occupied Italy. German forces in Italy were led by Kesselring, one of the war's ablest defensive commanders. Kesselring had a lot going for him. The rocky spine which runs almost the whole length of Italy meant the Allies had to advance along the coastal plains on either side. The only way to outflank the Germans was by amphibious landings. But by now, the necessary landing craft were earmarked for Normandy. As they went north to their prepared defensive positions, Kesselring's men destroyed the only lines of communication. In the towns, the Germans left booby traps. This was Naples. troops. There were tenacious troops who were well led. And uh, one point I like to make uh, is they're homogenous. Uh, they, were, uh, they were all of one nationality. They were all equipped with the same uh, weapons and ammunition. They ate the same food. They believed pretty much in the same God. And uh, we had, uh, I had 16 different nationalities with me. 
uh, some of whom couldn't eat this and couldn't eat that, and some that didn't want to fight on Fridays or some other day of the week, and uh, the British with their uh, uh, infantry weapons and your artillery completely different from ours. You couldn't move them with ease from one front to the other like the Germans could. Winter. The Allied ground commander, General Alexander, and his colleagues were now confronted with the unpleasant realities of their Mediterranean strategy. The Eighth Army, accustomed to swift advances across the desert, could only manage a few hundred yards a day. Across the mountains, Clark's 5th Army was also mudbound. They issued us galoshes after the rains had stopped. And if anybody was in the galoshes business, he could have found them by the millions along the roadside. <laughs> because you couldn't walk with them. I mean, they, uh, it was impossible to go through that mud. This was not the sunny Italy of the travel posters. And the only way an infantryman was going to come out of those mountains was to be carried out, you know. And uh, that's why uh, it was actually desirable to get wounded. Dreadful weather, difficult terrain, determined German resistance. To the men in the mud, this combination did not match up to Churchill's vision. I can see him now at his map in his persuasive way with his pointer pointing out the soft belly of the Mediterranean. And uh, after we got in there, I often thought of what a tough old gut it was instead of the soft belly that he had led us to believe. Before the end of 1943, the Allies were hammering at Kesselring's winter line. Alexander had 11 divisions, Kesselring 9, with 8 more in reserve. Every small mountain village had to be fought for. In December, the American 36th Division tried to take San Pietro. One of the things that most of our fighting was in Italy, you got into a position, you dug in, and you just stayed. I mean, we'd shoot at them and they'd shoot at us. Uh, and it was only when they were ready to leave that we moved forward. After 10 days, the Americans took San Pietro at heavy cost. In any unit, you would have a uh, Graves registration unit, and their job was to go around picking up bodies. And uh, what they would do is uh, either, if someone had been hastily buried, they would disinter him, or if he was just lying there, they'd pick him up and they would uh, slide them into the into the uh, mattress covers and pile them up into the trucks and take them off to a temporary cemetery somewhere. Uh, I suppose some. Uh, 
Some people probably got buried as many as four or five times that way, which is kind of um, unfortunate, really. I, I always thought uh, people should be left where they were. The Italian people had once been told by Mussolini, war puts the stamp of nobility on those who have the courage to meet it. At Tehran in November 1943, Roosevelt and Stalin overruled Churchill and at last fixed a definite date for the landing in France, May 1944. Italy was to become a sideshow. But after Tehran, Churchill refused to accept the deadlock in Italy. He got on to Roosevelt and persuaded him to lend landing craft for a new amphibious landing. The plan was in two stages. First, Mark Clark's 5th Army would attack the Germans at Casino, draw their forces southward, drain their reserves. Then the amphibious troops would strike behind their lines at Anzio, just 22 miles south of Rome. At Casino, the Germans held the high ground. They could see everything that moved in the valley below. The 5th Army attacked on January the 20th. Its troops had not been reinforced. They were cold, wet, exhausted. The attack failed disastrously. But the second stage of the plan went ahead two days later, the assault on Anzio. Having gone into Salerno uh, with uh, not enough troops, no commander ever has what he thinks he ought to have. And I was determined that if I was to be the commander going into Anzio or be the overall commander, that we should not go in a, on a shoestring. I went in with one and two-thirds division, uh, which was totally inadequate. Uh, but that's the way that's the way the ball bounces in war. You you do what you're told to do, or they'll get somebody else that will do it. The Germans expected a landing, but had no idea where it would come. They did not have enough troops to cover all the possible features. The Anzio force was completely unopposed. Nothing, an odd bang in the distance, but nothing. And when dawn broke, we'd got complete surprise. And a few minutes later, along the road, there came a marvellous drunken car swaying back and forth. It was full of the most happy Germans who had a night out in Rome, and they were staggering back, and they couldn't believe they were captured. They, they said, it's a kind of camarade, and they kept on embracing me. So finally, they put them in the cling, too. And that was the landing. Complete surprise. The Anzio beachhead was consolidated in an eerie calm. After Salerno, it seemed incredible that there was no instant German repast. Perhaps now was the time for a lightning dash in the style of General Patton for the gates of Rome. But the American commander at Anzio was no Patton. General Lucas was a cautious man who believed the beachhead must be secured before striking inland. Alexander did not overrule him. London Churchill complained bitterly, I thought we'd flung a wildcat into the Auburn Hills, but instead we got a whale floundering on the beach. 
there were only two battalions and some very old-fashioned coast batteries at the coast for defending. If the Americans had uh, realized the situation, they could stay on the evening of the landing day in Rome. General Lucas could, but uh, he would have soon been met by an overwhelming force which would defeat it. He'd, he'd have been defeated, no question about it. So we had to dig in on the biggest perimeter we could possibly uh, digest and wait for the onslaught which came. Caught off balance, as he often was by Alexander, Kesselring recovered fast. Spurred on by Hitler's demands for the immediate liquidation of the Anzio abscess, he threw all he had into the counterattack. If Anzio were eliminated, then perhaps the Allies would think again about crossing the English Channel. Allied advance units, which had spread out from the beaches, were overwhelmed by the weight of the German attack. There was one unit I know that uh, simply packed in, folded their greatcoats and handed themselves over. They couldn't take it anymore, and they were young, they hadn't seen this sort of thing before, and, and I don't blame them one little scrap. Two American Ranger battalions were captured and humiliatingly paraded through the streets of Rome. Beachhead could only be relieved from the south by breaking through the German defensive line which ran through the monastery of Monte Cassino. Perched high above the valley, an observation post here could see everything that moved for miles around. The Allies believed, wrongly, that the monastery had been fortified. It was the general view and the general belief of the troops who were involved on that front that Casino, the monastery at Casino, was being used for military purposes by the Germans. And that being the case, and it also being uh, a part of my military philosophy and a great many other people's too, that you must not put troops into battle without giving them all possible physical and material support that you can to give them the best chance of getting a success. On February the 15th, 1944, over 200 Allied bombers pounded the monastery into rubble. and ground attacks were badly coordinated, giving the Germans time to swarm into the rubble, ideal cover for defense. The Gustav line was hell.
At Anzio, Kesselring flung ten German divisions against the Allies' four and a half. Hitler hoped Anzio would be a turning point in Germany's fortunes. The unit that broke through, he promised, would have the honor of escorting Allied prisoners through the streets of Berlin. Last waves of German infantry were flung in. They came over a moon landscape, pitted, wrecked tanks, abandoned jeeps along the road, and I still to this day don't understand the German tactics. There was a moment when you actually could see them leaving their lines like those old films of the Somme battle and falling down as our machine guns took them. The German offensive lasted four days. In the end, it was the Allied superiority in heavy guns that tipped the balance. It was finally beaten back. The Germans had pulled back, but the Allies still lacked the strength to break out. It was stalemate. We then had to form trenches, and Anzio then became an old-fashioned World War I trench system. And they were bombed, and they were mortared, and then they had to do trench patrols, and occasionally keen generals used to send up people to try and find out who was opposite us and do a trench raid. It was right out of Journey's End. The two front lines were only yards apart. A couple of fellows were cleaning this machine gun, got it all to pieces, and Irish fellow named Tommy McGough was there, and he just looked up and he said, bloody Jesus Christ, he said, and he <laughs> tried and rushed for this gun, trying to put the barrel back on it, and putting it on upside down and all sorts, you know. Of course, I just looked and I said, quite all right, Tommy, I can see this fellow was... I go down to the wire and he speaks very good English. He says, where's friend? I said, he's gone. Oh, I said, it's quite all right. What have you got? Danish pork and fresh lemons. Of course, we give him a tinny bully beef. And we got talking to him about the position and the war and all that, you know. And he come from a place near Emden, Emden was it? Emden. Yeah. Emden. Yeah. And at the time, this city had a thousand bomber rage, you know. And I said, oh, you've had the bugger then. <laughs> You've had it. <laughs> no, no, he said, I come from a little village near Hampton. He said, me, OK. And he showed me his photos of his wife. She was a bus conductor in Hampton and that. And I says, uh, why don't you pack in? I said, You've had it now. I said, any time. He said, no. He says, German will not be beat. He says, we shall go right down, right down like that. He says, till we get near to the bottom. He said, well, then we shall join forces with Britain and America and fight Russia. Uh, and after that he just went, well, I never seen him anymore, like he must have got relieved the next night. And at meal time, they'd, the cooks would shout, grub up. You go with your mess tins down. For your grub. Before you could get down to the cook house, Anzio and he'd send one over, a big one, one of these cloud race, you know. Yeah. And you'd automatically, as soon as that base, you'd drop to the floor. You were always used to it. Oh. Uh, you walk crouch, they call it, if any, when you were walking about, you got the Anzio crouch.
And as you lay there, you used to tune in on the radios that you shouldn't have had <laughs> and uh, to the voice of Sally. Sally lived in Rome and she was a great, well, she sounded the most wonderful, sexy female ever. And she kept on giving messages to the troops. She said, hello, hello. And one of the women always think that the lower they speak, the more sexy they sound. And she had the lowest register of any woman. She said, hello, this is Sally. Why don't you come over and see me? Private Fox, you remember him last night? He stepped on a shoe mine. Nasty thing, shoe mine. You could hear Private Fox yelling for most of the night. Don't be like Private Fox. Come over to see Sally. <laughs> There would be a, a smart crack overhead and down would flutter a propaganda pamphlet saying, the Yanks are least lending your women. They're having a lovely time in jolly old England. And there was a picture of a naked woman being embraced by an American or an American tactfully knotting his tie while she did up her panties. At Casino, the Allies maintained the pressure. Their aim, to tie up as many German troops there as possible. A third attempt to take the ruined monastery opened with a massive bombing attack on Casino Town. 500 planes went in under the sporting code word Bradman batting tomorrow. Among the places knocked for six was the headquarters of the British Eighth Army. Once again, there was poor coordination between air and ground forces. After the bombing, the Germans came out of the ground and were in position again before the New Zealanders launched their attack. The German defenders were elite paratroops. The battle raged from house to house, room to room, cellar to cellar. New Zealand has lost 4,000 men. The Germans still held out. Three assaults on Monte Cassino, three bloody failures. The Allied commanders finally realized that to take the mountain, they must crush the defenders by weight of numbers. They massively reinforced the Fifth Army. They used, too, an elaborate deception plan to make the Germans think they were preparing another amphibious landing north of Rome. The Germans weakened their mountain defences to prepare for it. In May, the Allies at last outnumbered the Germans at Cassino by three to one. After an artillery barrage by 2,000 guns, the monastery fell. Polish troops were the first to reach the ruins where they raised their national flag. The eyes of the captured Germans told the story of their ordeal. The Germans were now in headlong retreat. Kesselring declared Rome an open city and attempted to regroup north of the capital. On the 25th of May, the Casino front linked up with the Anzio beachhead. 
Alexander's plan was for Clark to cut off the Germans' retreat. Instead, Clark threw everything into a drive for Rome. He was determined to get there before anyone else, and he did. On the evening of June the 4th, 1944, the first Allied troops entered the city. Those Romans who had backed the wrong side now paid the price. Clark's Roman triumph was short-lived. Kesselring would succeed in regrouping. Another Italian winter lay ahead. And in less than 48 hours, the world's attention would turn to another theater of war, the beaches of Normandy. 